I'm really not very familiar with the Bible story that I'm going to preach on today from Matthew chapter 25. And the reason is not that I haven't read it many times before, but it's just that the translation we're using is a little bit different than I grew up learning it. See, this parable of the bags of gold is a parable that I always knew as the parable of the talents. Maybe you've heard that before. And so a bag of gold actually is a a talent. A talent is a bag of gold, but that wouldn't have worked as well for my grade school basketball coach when he used this parable every season with us as his basketball team. You see, Coach Kramer is my hero. He's a guy who impacted my life in a great way in middle school, and he taught me great things about the fundamentals of basketball, but I believe he taught me even greater things about life and and faith and, and ministry. Whenever Coach Kramer would teach us as his students and as his his players, he would use the parable of the talents at the beginning of every season. And he would say, you know, some of you are given a certain thing from God. Others of you are given other things from God. And so not all of us will have the same results, but what God expects is that we will give our best and we will invest all that we have been given and will we be managers of, of what he's given to us. So we're going to play some teams that have lesser talent than us. We'll play a lot of teams that have more talent than us. And I don't expect you to be the best team in our city or the best team in the state, but I expect you to be the best team that you can be. And he used the parable of the talents as an emphasis from Jesus so that we would acknowledge that our gifts and our talents are on loan to us from God. I'm not sure had the translation we were using when I was in 6th, 7th, and 8th grade said bags of gold, that it would have communicated as well with me as a middle school student who couldn't even fathom owning and having in my possession $20 or $100, much less bags upon bags of gold. But alas, today we have the story, the parable of the talents, a.k.a. the parable of the bags of gold, and I believe the lesson is still the same. God gives, what do we do with what God has given to us? In Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 through 30, Jesus continues to talk about what the kingdom of heaven is like. We've already heard some of those parables. We'll look at another one next week as well. But here he compares the kingdom of heaven to a man who is a master, a master who entrusts his wealth. That is, bags of gold, or the Greek word is is talent, to his servants. And so these bags of gold are given. To one, there's five bags. To another, there are two bags. To another, there's one bag. And sometimes we make a mistake. We think, well, poor guy that only got one bag. The other one's got two. The other one got five. It's like that kid at Christmas who only gets one gift while the brother or the sister are getting more. He has every right to be mad with Santa Claus. Well, it's not like that. It really isn't. Because if we really look at what talent means or what the bag of gold is, one talent by our current standards today would roughly be $600,000. So even one talent, we're talking about a pretty nice chunk of change. We're talking about even a, a modest income for one year of a professional athlete. We're talking about a very, very good gift in a bag. And so God here has entrusted his wealth like a master to his servants. And so do we, what do we learn about God from this? Two main points. First of all, God's the owner. God is the owner of all things. There is not a single item in all of the universe of which God cannot say, that's mine. He can say that of everything. He has rights to everything in all creation. He is the creator of the heavens and the earth. He is the creator of you and me. He looks at us and he says, I have fearfully and wonderfully made you. You belong to me. But on top of that, as those who belong to God in Jesus Christ, those who trust in him, God also not only says to us, you belong to me because I made you, but you're doubly mine because I've claimed you again in the water and the word. I've claimed you as a child. I've claimed you as a forgiven sinner. I've claimed you as a new creation bought with the precious blood of Christ. You are mine not once but twice, born not once but born twice. You belong to me. 
God is the owner of all things. And notice the parable, what it says in verse number 14. It says, when he called his servants, he entrusted his wealth to them. It is his wealth throughout. Whether the bags of gold are in the possession of the master or they have been placed into the care of his servants, the wealth always remains his. Whether it is here in our pockets or there on the altar, whether that money is in the bank or it's between our mattresses, it still belongs to God. Whether that ability is to play basketball or to play the violin, it still belongs to God. God is the owner of everything. And secondly, His graciousness is shown in that He gives to His servants. The word here is that He entrusted His wealth to them. It still belongs to Him, but He, with a high level of confidence in His people, has entrusted everything we are and everything we have to us. So now that gives us a pretty strong responsibility. So what is the responsibility that we learn from in this parable? Well, the parable of the bags of gold draws us to a deeper understanding of God's gifts and everything belongs to Him, and also of our faithful management of God's gifts. He is the owner, we are the manager. Imagine if you are a worker at a restaurant and you work through the process and you put in your years and you put in your hard service and you please your owner and you are given a position of authority as a shift manager or as a store manager. That is a great entrustment of confidence to you, isn't it? If you're the owner and you have a manager, you put a lot of confidence and faith in them. And so a manager is expected to treat the place like it's his or her own. If I go into Culver's and I order something and it's not right and the, the, the employee doesn't make it right, I might say, I want to talk to the manager. And the manager will come and say, well, Mr. Alexander, we've seen you once or twice before this week, uh, once or twice this week. We've seen your kids. We're going to make it right, right? We're going to make it right. So the manager is entrusted with the authority of the owner to make it happen, to do the work. But what will happen if over a long period of time, that manager starts to act like they own the place, start to make decisions that only the owner should make, start to do things and claim things that the owner can only do or claim, the owner's going to have to have a conversation with his or her manager. And I think the owner might say graciously, hey, how about you go and own your own franchise? Or they more likely might say, your time of employment here." is over or we need to have a big change. A change would need to be made if there is a blurring of the lines between the owner and the manager. And so it is with the parable. God remains the owner and He has high expectations of those who manage His property for Him, His wealth for Him, everything for Him while He is away. While we await the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ on the last day, God has entrusted to us, first and foremost, the good news of the gospel of Jesus, that it is ours to proclaim unto all of the world what God has done in His Son, Jesus. And along with that greatest gospel gift come all of the gifts of this life, house and home, wife and children, land and animals, and all that I have. It says in Luther's explanation to the first article of the Creed, all that I have belongs to God. And that makes me a manager or a steward of it. Stewardship is one of those words that makes us uncomfortable in the church, but it really shouldn't if we understand what biblical stewardship is. And this is how our church body, the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod, helps us to look at stewardship. And I love this definition. Look at what it says. It says, stewardship is the free and joyous activity of the child of God and of God's family, the church, in managing all of life and life's resources for God's purposes. If God's purpose for His people is to glorify Him and serve our neighbor, love God and love others, the two greatest commandments, what He has entrusted to us are means to an end. The wealth, the talents, the abilities... The gifts that He has given to us are means to an end. The end is to glorify God and to serve our neighbor. The way in which we do that is freely and joyously living as a child of God 
managing what is on loan to us from above. You see, sometimes it drives me nuts when I hear preachers get up and talk about money in such a way that is so unbiblical. They say things like, well, if you give me this, God will give you that. Baloney, right? That is not how God designs it. Or if you give this, you will earn favor from above. Baloney. That's not what God says. You have been given favor in His Son, Jesus. Now you're given a free opportunity to serve. You're able to invest your gifts, not to get something out of it, but because you've already been given so much, you want to freely and joyously respond. Do you see the difference? This is gospel that changes life. So simply put, stewardship is a life of faith. It is nothing short, nothing more, nothing less than a life of faith. During this Reformation celebration, we emphasize the importance of being saved by God's grace through faith and faith alone, right? So God has given His grace, that is His lavish, lavish riches to us freely, not because of who we are, but because of who He is. And He has placed His blessing in our life not because of what we have done, but because of what Jesus has done. That when we look at his life, we look at the cross where he died, we look at the empty tomb where he rose, we say, God is gracious to me. He loves me. He makes me his own. And then through faith, we take hold of that. When God planted the seed of his spirit in your heart, God gave birth to faith within you. When you continue to nourish that seed through the watering of God's Word, through the receiving of His Supper, God grows that faith in you. And what does faith do? It takes hold of the grace of God. It enables you to live a life that pleases Him. Faith alone. Managing all of life and life's resources for God's purposes and glory. Luther once talked about faith. Last week we emphasized what he said about grace. Look at what he says about faith. He said, faith is a living and daring, a bold, a risk-taking confidence in God's grace, so sure and certain that a man could stake his life on it a thousand times. That's faith in Jesus Christ. That's faith that boldly clings to the promises of God. That's faith that says, even when I don't understand, God, what you're up to, I don't understand how this works. I can't wrap my mind around it we ultimately say, God, I trust you. I trust you, and I stake my life upon your grace a thousand times by faith. It's a living and daring confidence in our master. So that master, finally in the story, returns from his journey. Just like one day we know that our master Jesus will return from heaven above to come and claim us on earth below and bring us into his forever kingdom. And on that day of accounting, as the parable describes it, there is the accounting of all of his stewards come before him and have to let him know how they worked as his managers. And there's only one accounting, but there's different results. Now, if you're just reading the story, you would think, well, there's three different guys that got gifts, three different bags of gold, each bag of gold at a different amount. Uh, one was one, so it was about 600,000. Another was two, about 1.2 million. One was five, well, that was about three million. I'd say they're doing pretty well. So would there be three responses from the master? But no, there's actually only two. So as the story goes, the master calls the first one before him. And he not only has the five bags of gold that the master had given to him, but he brings another five. Another five, we don't know how he came up with it, but he invested it wisely. He multiplied the gifts that he had been given. And he said to his master, you entrusted me with five bags of gold. See, I have gained five more. And in verse 21, his master replied, well done. Good and faithful servant, you have been faithful with a few things. I'll put you in charge of many things. Come on and share your master's happiness. You see, the first result is joyfully sharing. Joyfully sharing. The one who had invested what he had been given on loan from God now joyfully shares with God the blessings of heaven. He joyfully shares in what God has given to him because he has invested what God has loaned 
to him. Really, you see that point. It says, come and share your master's happiness. Well done, or we could say, excellent, good, and faithful servant. That is what God expects of his people. That no matter what those talents and abilities and gifts and treasures are, that we invest them and share them joyfully. Now, one problem that I have, and that I think all of us have, is that we sometimes look at the person who has the five when we've only got two, and we say, why don't I have that? You know, this person has a, a really nice home, and I, I can barely meet my mortgage payments. This person is driving that car that I've dreamt of for many years. Why can't I drive that car? This person can score 39 points in a single basketball game, and I am getting splinters on my behind on the bench. Why can't I have that? And so maybe it's no wonder that God has given us not just one commandment, but two that deal with coveting. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not cover your neighbor's spouse, his his, his workers, his animals, his his Lexus, his his, his iPhone, his his, his Xbox, his his seven-story mansion, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. So it's not a matter of saying, well, God, I didn't get what that person did, but instead it's being content of saying, God, you have blessed me richly, Even if I only have one talent, in your eyes, that is a generous blessing. It's not so matter of what I do, but it's how I do it. It's not so much about the how much there is, but how I handled what I've received. You see, the joyfully sharing in God's gracious gifts is the result that God wants for His children. And two people, both the five-talent guy and the two-talent guy, carrying their master's bags, have invested wisely, and they joyfully share. But the second result is the result that is painful to hear. That the second result is the one who fearfully buries what he has been given. Notice what he says when he is called to give an account. He said, Master, I knew that you're a hard man, harvesting where you haven't sown, gathering where you haven't scattered seed. I don't think that's true. So I was afraid, and I went out and hid your gold in the ground. So see, here is what belongs to you. You know what the problem is? This person no longer saw themselves as a manager, but they saw themselves as the owner. They said, this isn't the master's, this is mine, and I'm going to do whatever I want with it. And I'm going to stick it in the ground because I'm scared of the master and I'll just bring that back to him whenever he comes and asks me to. I was afraid and I went out and I hid your gold in the ground. And look how the master responds. He says, you wicked, lazy servant. So you knew that I harvest where I have not sown. You knew that I gather where I have not scattered seed. Well, then you should have at least put my money on deposit with the bankers so that when I returned, I would have received it back with interest. My dad is in the banking industry. I told him once that Matthew 25, verse 27 should be on his business cards. Dad, banking is is, is blessed by God. It's a good career. I was kidding. But instead, you should have at least done that. Gain some interest with that. At least give it to the bankers. But instead, they fearfully buried. They fearfully missed out on the blessing that they could have in giving glory to God and having fun with that And the blessing that they could have of seeing other people be blessed by what they have been given. But what's the main reason for these two different results? The main reason comes back to faith. And the object of our faith is always God. The different results is resulted because of a different view of God. The person who buried his talent in the ground had a false understanding of God. He viewed him as a harsh and hard man, one that would just harvest and not do the work of scattering the seed, which is clearly, clearly wrong as far as the Bible says that God scatters the seed and makes it bud and flourish. They had an understanding that God was just looking to judge and condemn people, and they had a false understanding of him as harsh and an angry God. Instead of those who joyfully shared saw God for his true nature, that he is a loving and gracious God. Does he have high expectations? Yes. Does he punish the wicked? Yes. For those who act like they are owners when they are managers, will he say, get out? Yes. But he is a loving God at his core. 
And the perspective on God as a God of love changes everything in life. It changes how we see Him, how we see ourselves, and how we see what He has given to us. This week, as we gather for Thanksgiving with our family and with our friends, we live as people of faith and we give thanks to God. This week, you'll be in the presence of family members, some of whom you haven't seen for a long period of time. This week, you might see some people who don't believe in Christ like you do, and it's a chance for you to witness to, to God as the source of everything that is good. How does faith change your perspective? Well, faith in three ways changes our perspective. One, it changes our perspective on who is God, who God the Master is. Is He the Lord of your life? Is He looking at you as He does to the whole universe and says, that's mine. You see, we have been doubly made God's own. He is our Lord and He is our Master and He is a gracious and faithful Father. Secondly, faith changes our perspective on what God has done for you. You cannot separate God's graciousness from the cross of Jesus. You can't separate a Thanksgiving feast from Jesus either. He's the bread of life. He's the joy of our hearts. He's the light of the world. He's the God who is the center of who we are, and He has done it for you, making you God's own freely by grace. And thirdly, faith changes your perspective on how the Master will bless those who trust in Him. You see, He won't bless you because you do this or that. No. He blesses you because of who He is. And who He is is the God who says to those who have been faithful managers, excellent, well done. Come and share in your master's happiness.